Well, there was two lanes here and they were almost parallel to each other. Right behind me here, up just behind this arch, was uh, Murphy's Lane. And further down, almost at the back here of what is uh, the De La Salle or Stephen Street Monastery, was Usher's Arch. They were probably the two worst lanes in Waterford, insofar as both on health terms regarding the times of fever and cholera, uh, almost everyone, without exception, would get the fever. In other places, maybe 10%, maybe 20%, 30%, whatever, but almost everyone, 100% of the people. The living conditions were absolutely horrible. People live like animals, and because they live like animals, they also behave like animals. Now, these weren't uh, corporation-owned uh, houses. These were owned by private individuals. Uh, many, many city councillors would have owned these. And because there was no incentive uh, in the landlord's minds to do them up, because, as I said, the people lived quite literally like animals, they behaved like animals also. And uh, in Usher's Arch, Murphy's Lane was particularly bad. But we, in living memory, uh, Usher's Arch was there. And we had guys with very colourful names like Kate, the Queen of Usher's Arch, Pat the Lad, Francis Menton, and these were notorious characters around town. Notorious for many things, for prostitution and, and particularly for drunkenness. You would always invariably see every week on the police court, you would see people from Murphy's Lane and from Usher's Arch in the, in the courts, mainly because of, of, of drinking and that. But the living conditions were absolutely horrendous. You know, probably no pro Well, look, they wouldn't have been, as we would know, toilets that would flush. Indeed, in many of the houses, there may not have been any toilets at all particularly if there was tenements around the area, there's probably no tiler whatsoever. So people would quite literally have to dump their pots or their chamber pots out the window. And, uh, and that was it. It was a horrific sight, horrific time. It was, certainly wasn't the good old days. Um, that was Murphy's Lane. Uh, Cannon Power wrote about it. Uh, Donovan, the guy who went along and did the, the Griffiths valuation, wrote about it and put down personal notes that uh, you go in one end, but you wouldn't come out the other end. It was very, very bad. Very, very violent society, probably because of, 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 of the, the, the drinking, you know, and it would be all whiskey, it wouldn't be beer, it would be whiskey. The town would have been full of cheap whiskey shops, and the reason they were so cheap is because if you had a good pub, you paid more taxes. So the worst type of pub you had, the less taxes you paid. And uh, I said it was just a notorious place for whiskey drinking. Well, Murphy's Lane would have existed uh, perhaps from the 1700s, maybe the early 1800s. Usher's Arch a little bit later, but Usher's Arch uh, lived on in, into the 20th century, perhaps the 1930s or 1940s, Usher's Arch would have closed. And when the public housing seams around the city began to open up, uh, they would have been housed there. And a very important thing to note is that the first public housing in Ireland was in Waterford uh, around the 1880s and that was uh, St. Joseph Terrace up in Green Street. However, the rents were fairly high, even though it was a council corporation uh, establishment, and uh, only tradesmen could have afforded that. Like the poor people that live down here in this area and in the tenements, there's no way could they afford it. And was it tenements houses out here? Tenements would have been large houses. You would have had them all over the place. Uh, you would have had them in Alexander Street. You would have had them... You know, when, when the gentry, so to speak, vacated the city and uh, it became, well, the population of Waterford was always fairly constant, you know, between 26,000 up to 30,000. And that was like that up, the, up, up into, the, into the, the 20th century, you know, well into the middle 20th century. Uh, so they would have lived in these and if somebody, if somebody vacated a room, and it was a fairly big room. Another family would move in and they might get a bigger room. And that's the way people went. Uh, so a lot of people lived, but, but the, the, the cottages, as they were known, uh, terrible places. It would have been cottages and it would have been a mixture of cottages and tenements all around the place, you know. But the lanes were extremely narrow. I don't think there's any place. I think perhaps uh, in the only lane that might be comparable to what a lot of these streets look like would be New Street Court. Um, Again, because all the writers mention how narrow the streets were in Waterford. Extremely narrow, like, as I said, that might be the only one. Maybe another one might be Arundel Lane. Uh, the very narrowest part of Arundel Lane uh, might 
uh, give you an idea of what the streets and the lanes in Waterford look like. Extremely narrow, you know. Thank you. Huh? That sounds very... Yeah. 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 Grand. Uh, where are we standing now? Well, this is known as Corrigan. Uh, would have been called Corrigan Park now, but it's old Corrigan Lane. But it's even older than the lane, and it's 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 a name from the Irish language, Corrigan, which means a, a small rock, a rocky area. And uh, in the 1600s, it was corrupted by the English, by the Cromwellians, to Cow Rock. And you'll actually see that in the civil survey. It's called Cow Rock. But Corrigan is the proper name. And uh, it became, it's, it lent its name then to an area rather than a street, but, uh, which is actually w would be correct. And the lane came later on. And uh, it's here, it's quite a famous little lane because we're bounded here by the St. By St. Patrick's Church. And behind me here, we believe could be the man's house or where the, where the, 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 the vicar lived or the priest lived. And uh, that's the building behind me. But there was a very, very famous inn here, right on the corner. I would believe over here where Black Tie is, this shop over here, and it was known as the Black Buy Inn. It was a very famous coaching tavern, and uh, it burned down, but we have a great description uh, from uh, the, the late 1800s of how it looked like before it burned down. It was known as the Black Buy Inn, and uh, it then changed its name then to the Angel Tavern and uh, after the fire. But it's, it's absolutely, I mean, you can, you can imagine people coming up from the city and coming into the city because the gate up in St. Patrick's Gate, up on the middle, almost opposite St. Patrick's Church, was the, the West Gate into Waterford. It was the main entrance into Waterford. They would come in or they're going out. they come in, they might have a, their first drink in the Black Buy Inn here. And coming out, it could be the last drink as they went out the way. But Corrigine then again was a very, very narrow lane. And like I said about Murphy's Lane and Usher's Arch, living conditions were horrific. Small little cottages, uh, very small, and again, no proper sanitation whatsoever. And again, the, 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 the refuse, well, if we want to call it that, would be just thrown out on the road and hoping that a good shower would come to take it away. So, particularly Carrigine is always mentioned in times of cholera and there was two big epi epidemics of cholera in Waterford. One was in 1832 and the other one was 1849 and everybody, but everybody in Carrigine got it. Everybody. It was, it was probably the most unhealthiest uh, lane in Waterford at that particular period. Even worse than uh, Murphy's Lane and Usher's Arch that we spoke about before. So it, it was that. It was, it was where the poorest of the poor lived. And uh, the houses that stand here now wouldn't be a reflection of the houses? With the exception maybe those houses over there, I'm not too sure. We don't have any real photographs, you know, of, of, of going back in, into the mid-1800s, of any of the lanes as such, you know. Uh, we, it's, everybody took photographs of the big major streets, but they forgot about the lanes, you know. Yeah, we do have some of Jenkins Lane, but uh, these lanes, no. And besides that, if you went into Murphy's Lane with a camera, yeah, to be, by the time you came out, to be gone on you. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was that type of area, you know. And I said it's important, to, again, to, 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 to emphasise that. Yeah, there was the public housing wasn't available for these people, you know. Uh, like you had, and I mean, if you compare this even now, these houses here now, to uh, St. Joseph's Terrace and Green Street, which were the first public houses, the difference is vast, you know. The, the, the one St. Joseph's Terrace, brick, very good space out the back for a toilet. Uh, well, they had ash pits at the beginning, which were uh, simply, they wouldn't have been tilers. They would have been, you dig a hole out in the back and when you, when you clean out your fire, you, you went to the tilers in the hole and you threw the ash in it. Uh, the corporation also had a machine going around. This young lad here would be horrified. And it, it was known as the inkwell. So they go around and particularly where I come from, up Tile Street area, at the back of the houses, there's sort of a, a runway up the back. And the corporation cart would go in there and people would have to go into the toilet. And this, this guy's job to go in, shovel all the stuff into this uh, inkwell, as they call it. Now you go back and you can think of back in the 40s and even 50s. No showers. Everybody got washed in a zinc bath in the middle of the floor. Men, women, children, everybody. I did. Even my oldest son, who's far, only 40, he... In my mother's house, we didn't have a shower. He got, but so you can imagine, there was no incentive really to have a bath because you were going to go back into the same, if you'll pardon the expression, shitty job the next day. 
So, like, people would have smelled quite a lot, depending on the jobs. This man, this woman told me her father was a guy who used to go around shoveling this into the inkwell. And that, as you can imagine, then the smell, both in the nostrils, on the clothes, people working in breweries, <clears throat> people working in gut houses, people working, no showers, no incentive to wash. The smell must have been absolutely terrible. So here we are, Carrigeen, the Little Rock. About, uh, Dinka, when would, about what time would that have been? Uh, it would be in the 40s and 50s. Yeah, 40s and 50s. Okay. And also, when you say Carrigan now is uh, very poorly, um, what kind of families would have lived here? Do we have any records or any information on that? Oh, yeah, we have, we have, but they would have been the poorest of the poor. You know? Hmm. They would have been the poorest of the poor. So, um, is there any... Uh, I suppose I'm kind of looking for... a. Is there like a particular background or is there a particular... Um, no, it's just what people... Led to people being in these dire It's states, just like. what people could afford. And uh, like a lot of these people maybe had very, very menial jobs, wouldn't have the money, couldn't afford their... Well, I mean, that's essentially it. You know, like uh, you, you, you only stayed where you could afford. I mean, in, in one, in one uh, house down on John Street, uh, in an entry it was called, I think there was something like in the one house... There was something up there now. I'm, I, I'm right, about 75 people lived in the one house. You could have one or two families living in one room. I mean, there were horrific times. I mean, like, they weren't the good old days by any stretch of the imagination. And then there was no toilet. There was no communal toilet. What you did, you had maybe curtained off part of the room to use as a toilet into a chamber pot. You opened the window and threw it out. And I said, hope for a good shower of rain. So, like, there were really, really, really hard times. Really hard times. Yeah, I mean, we, we, you, you know, you, a simple thing. No, toilet paper. Everybody takes toilet paper for granted. It's non-existent. Like, again, I think I might have said it on one of the other uh, programmes, that, you know, my job when I was a young fella up in Dial Street was to get the, the local paper, the Monster Express, and cut it into small squares and hang it on the... On, on, on the we had an outside toilet and have put a hole through it, put a string in it, and hang it up on a nail in the toilet. So when you went to the toilet then, if the paper was relatively new, you could read the headlines off your backside. <laughs> you know? But I mean, that's it. But before that then, people didn't have, any, didn't have newspapers. Didn't have anything. So, do you know, to clean yourself, a clump of grass, whatever, in, in a tenement down the town, these are the aspects of, of, of society and living that people forget about. The small little tasks that are just, just so regular to us now, the means didn't exist to clean yourself, didn't exist whatsoever. You could take children as, or a man or something suffering from diarrhoea, right? In a small room, maybe, maybe, maybe 10 people living in the one room. The smells in the room, you know, people forget. I think it was Jack O'Neill, the, the, the late historian, water historian, uh, wrote a great article once about the smells of Waterford. Now, those weren't the smells he was talking about, but he was talking about the smells from the breweries, from the docks, uh, from the shambles, the meat shambles, the fish shambles, you know. Uh, and it was quite common that people at the end of a lane, particularly if it was a cul-de-sac, that they would dump all the rubbish down at the end of the lane. And this rubbish would dump, fill up, fill up, fill up, fish's heads, if there was somebody mm, killing chickens, the chickens' heads, everything was thrown on this heap. So it was extremely unhealthy. Uh, it was, I think, in, in, the, in the late 1800s, it was the unhealthiest city in Waterford. That was in one of the last lectures I did on, on, on society in Waterford. Uh, I'm just from memory now, but definitely at that period, it was the unhealthiest city in Waterford. You know. Then you had St. Patrick's. You must remember St. Patrick's Church alongside of us. Burials continued up to the 1860s. That also contributed to, uh, because uh, there was a very famous Waterford doctor called Dr. Mackesy, and he advocated the building of uh, a burial ground outside of Waterford City, purely because you had decomposing animal matter. And human bodies are the same animal matter. If decomposing, it leads to, 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 to illness, you know, and, and, and to, to fevers and the cholera and everything. So that's why Ballinanation was built on the outskirts of the city, because of this man. And uh, the final one, when 
I built the, the, the dumping at the end of the lane and that, like when with the municipal waste collection and stuff, I started becoming that. Oh, well, that was always the case, right up, in, right up into, uh, into, into the mid-1900s, perhaps even later, you know? Uh, and then, like, things became more organised and, and the City Council Corporation would have scavengers, that were called, to take them away, you know? There was a manure dump, that's called, a manure dump, down in a, a Miller's Marsh. Now it's the car park, though. But it was, but people didn't, you know, you didn't bring your rubbish out, you just threw it out on the road and hoped that someone would take it away. Or there was a good shore of rain, as I said. Very, very unhealthy. You know? Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Is that okay? Do you understand that? Do you learn that? <laughs> What's your man's there? <clears throat> I just talk about the lanes, Ollie, I suppose, the best thing to do. Yeah, and we're trying uh, to talk about character lanes because people know the word name Gart Lane because yeah, 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 yeah. But they don't know the history. So. Yeah. Well, um, can you tell us where we are now at the moment? Well, we're down here in what is known as uh, Broad Street. Now, it's now called John Roberts Square. But the original name would have been Broad Street. And up to 1857, there was a block of buildings here in this square here. And you had various lanes that intersected here. Uh, right across over here were Heroes and Lifestyle and McDonald's. Is. Yeah, okay. It's Quasimodo. <laughs> Did you hear that one about him, about him dying yeah, and his brother going for the job, did you? Yeah. But he had no arms, you know? And uh, so they had a big interview outside Notre Dame anyway, a big, big, big... Uh, so somebody, look at your man up there, he said, with no fucking arms, he said. We call him up for the crack. How he said, yeah, are you going for the job? Yeah, he said. He, but he said, you have no arms, he said. Quasimodo was my brother, he said. He said, uh, he said, now how would you ring the bell? He said, I give it a note, he said. So she said, yeah, can we go up and give you a trial? So he mounted up anyway and he gave the bill a note. I said, what the fuck? He said, that's some sound, he said. How do you do that? I know, he said, it runs in the family. He said, we're all great bell ringers. So, anyway. so he got the job and he was up there one day, noting the bells and everyone was fucking saying the best sound ever, you know? So we went to give him the thing and he fucking slipped and fell off and down on the ground and all the people crowded around him. He said, where the fuck did he come out of? So your man said, I'm not too sure, he said, about who he is, but his face rings the bell. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, isn't it? It's fucking terrible, but it's good, though. I love it. So, uh, where are we standing at the moment? Well, we're standing here now, what people know nowadays as John Roberts Square, but originally known as Broad Street, because it was just a broad air, a big wide street. But up to the 1850s, there was a block, oh, 18, sorry, 1857, there was a block of buildings here uh, and it was intersected by lanes. Now, you come here, that's Blackfire Street, right running through the middle of the block of buildings going into the street down there was Garter Lane. Behind this building here where Code Shoe Shop is and uh, behind this tent, I should say, that was Rile Oak Lane and over where Heroes is and Lifestyle, that was Little Baron Strand Street. So essentially, that's Garter Lane ran essentially through here. Now, why is it called Garter Lane? Well, I won't say you find it written in the book, but I think for obvious reasons that prostitution was, was very, very prevalent in, in dark areas. And because it was so dark here in the lanes, that's why all these dark areas would have been used by ladies of the evening. Is there much on the record about uh, prostitution? Oh, there is quite a lot, yeah, but you see it mentioned in the city courts, a uh, bit areas, and Barn Strand Street was particularly bad. And so that would, but I said it was gone. 1857, the buildings were knocked down. They took all the bricks in the buildings, they brought it down to the park, they were all recycled because the park wasn't built up in 1857. So they dumped all the bricks into what was then a marshland and solidified it, made it nice and solid, and then covered it over and made the People's Park. So there was recycling at that period. And what were the buildings that stood here have been? Warehouses. They weren't tenements, they weren't houses, they were warehouses. And they probably just serviced uh, the, probably the ships on the quay and various industries around, you know? I mean, at that stage it was an industrial city, you know? So, uh, and about, uh, when were they demolished? 1857, they were demolished. 
and as I said, all the bricks were brought down. And an interesting thing, if you take a walk down around the park and walk around the walls of the park, the rock for the par People's Park was taken from Bilberry Rock, but you will see intersected in the walls all along as you walk along, red brick. And this is where they came from, from the buildings here, and they're still in the walls. So this area now, um, am I right in saying that here, I'm mean, looking down Georgia Street and back up yeah. the ground? Yeah. Would, um, would this fall be kind of lanes in the lock and lanes? So what would, oh, sorry, what would the city and what would this area have looked like? Well, uh, I said the big building would have been here and the lanes, the Garter Lane would have been very, as I said earlier about the other lanes, they would have been very, very narrow. Very narrow. And just to go through them again, where we go straight across here into there was Garter Lane. And uh, over here then, as I say again, was Little Barrel Stand Street and Ryle Oak Lane. And it was the Ryle Oak, it was quite Ryle Oak Lane, Ryle Oak Lane, we called so because after a, a tavern, which was called the Ryle Oak Tavern. Oh, there was a small little, in, you're talking about some of the streets here, myriad of little lanes all over the Giants, yeah. I mean, you have Arundel Lane up there, as we know in my youth as Crewbean Lane, very, very narrow, and you will all get an idea of how, it, when you go in past the pub, you can see how narrow the lane actually goes. They were extremely narrow, and all the early writers mention how narrow the lanes in Waterford were, unbelievably narrow. And in the 1800s, then, there was a, a commission called the White Street Commission, and uh, so they enlarged on, knocked down all the buildings and uh, enlarged the roads, you know, because carriages couldn't get through. The market area would have been up here, uh, up in Broad Street, right just up above us. And uh, so that's, that's, that's where the market area, and then they had to move it up because there's so much cattle around, so many horses around, so many pigs, they had to move it outside of the city. But that's going back to the medieval period. Thank you. Rest up. Now we're we'll going to, we'll just go to the entrance. There we go. Okay, brilliant. Um, where are we standing now? Well, we're standing outside uh, the Roman Catholic St. Patrick's uh, Church here, down in George Street, just off George Street. Uh, the church itself dates from around 1742. It was originally founded by the Jesuits. And a uh, very interesting church in so far as that when the penal laws existed in, in, New, in Canada, Newfoundland, and there was no priest allowed to uh, practice there, uh, the water of people in Newfoundland would take their children back from Newfoundland and have them baptised here in St. Patrick's. The registers, I believe, even though I've never seen, are still in existence, so all the Newfoundlanders uh, have been registered here. An amazing fact. And when, do you know until what date they were still registered? Well, until, I suppose, like... Uh, Catholic emancipation came here in 1828, 1829, so I presume if from that period, I'm not sure about Canada, if uh, Catholic emancipation would have been enacted at the same time, but that would have then, a uh, priest would have been allowed then to, to practice uh, at, at that area, so, era, so. And that's, so that's the reason for why they had to register back here, it wasn't because they just didn't have a priest over there? Is that the it, it was, because the priests weren't allowed to practice there, so they didn't have a priest there. And uh, so they, came, they brought them all back. And this entrance right here, can you tell us about, can you tell us about this entrance right, um, the original entrance right? Well, this is, no, this is a, a relatively new entrance. Uh, the old entrance is just down a little bit there by Welch's Pub, and that was the original entrance in, and it kind of went in, it turned left, and that was the entrance then into the, into the church. And what about the story that was originally a grain store or something? Yeah, the, it was a, originally a grain store, and a, and a fellow called um, a Jesuit, a Waterford man, uh, Father St. Ledger, he actually have it in, in, in a record of the judge himself that he actually got money from his friends in Salamanca in Spain and some of his Irish friends and they built the church here. So that was seven, about around 1742. And now it's no longer a parish, St. Patrick's? I don't know. Okay. Don't know. And what about emigration in general from Waterford? Emigration in general from Waterford um, would have been particularly in the 1850s, you could have taken a ship for, from Waterford City here to places like uh, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and particularly to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, many of the ships were run by a religious group called the Quakers, and they were very well provisioned, and uh, the pastors were very well looked after. 
but contrary to the popular belief that it was only the poor people who escaped from Ireland during the famine, quite the opposite. It was, if you look at the papers, you will see that there were well-off farmers, there were um, tradespeople, and people essentially who had money. Those who had no money could only live in the hope that somebody they knew in America would send them back a couple of pounds. They would then take the Mars steamer, which was a steamer ship that plied between here and England, and they would take the larger ships from Liverpool and go on. These ships then became known as the coffin ships because they just packed the people in. And uh, there was quite a lot of fever, dysentery on the ship. An awful lot of people died, hence the name, the coffin ships. So it, again, and again, uh, it, it was a lot of, during the workhouse period, around the same time, around the 1850s and that, a lot of uh, girls from the workhouse would have been sent away to places like uh, Australia, uh, America, over to the colonies. And John, well, I want to say something just about the famine. Or, I mean, in Waterford, it wasn't so bad, was it? You know? Oh, it was. Oh, it was. Yeah, places, yeah, oh, yeah, it was. Uh, maybe not to the same extent that you would have had, but places like out the country, like Bun Man, uh, was extremely bad. And you must remember, in 1846 then, uh, people had to work on the roads to get money to buy food. But they forgot, you see, that people were famished. They had no food, they had no energy. And I came across a very sad story in Bun Man of a young girl, uh, the father, uh, he was a widow, a widower, and he was working on the roads and he became ill through malnutrition. And she had to go out and work on the roads instead of him. And uh, like, it just, was just an impossible. She was, only, she was only 14 years old. Uh, quite a lot, a lot of people then would have came from the, the uh, surrounding areas into Waterford, into the workhouse. And uh, it was, a, again, a, a horrific time. And what about the story that the Quakers and the Christian brothers worked together on famine relief and what? Is that true? Or? Never heard any evidence of the Christian brothers, but I definitely, loads and loads of evidence of the Quakers. They essentially opened up um, the, the, the soup houses around the city. They had one down at, at the fish house, which was down at the clock tower. They had one up in the fanning house, which was up in the glen. And uh, the, the Quakers were extremely active, more so. Well, according to the local papers, and there was no reason to think that the papers were anti-Catholic and they wouldn't uh, report about the, the Catholics because we had two papers in Waterford. You had the Mail and you had uh, the Waterford Chronicle. And they, the Waterford Chronicle would have been pro-Catholic, so to speak. So, and the Waterford News, I beg your pardon, would have been pro-Catholic. And the Waterford Chronicle. And the Waterford Mail would have been Protestant, would have been, you know, anti-sort of Catholic. But, uh, so there was no evidence that I found in any of the papers that would suggest that there was a major uh, Roman Catholic effort to help people during the famine. Not saying it didn't happen, but it wasn't reported. Thanks very much, sir. Well, we got on, the last one we want to get to is just about the... the con Tell us about the port, how it was, you know, Well, it was originally obviously quite small and it kept a, a large and up then coming up towards, we say, what we now know as the new bridge. And uh, the port would really be full of ships, you know. The, the, the quay itself, all the early writers mentioned the quay and that is probably one of the, the, if not the finest quay in Europe. It's absolutely fabulous. And it would be full because you must remember we had all the, the, the bacon sellers in that here and all the, the, the trade, particularly with Newfoundland, was absolutely huge. But going back even to the, before that, uh, you would have a huge wine trade between here. You would have names, it's like there's a statue to a guy called Lorenzo Power in Cadiz in Spain. So there was a huge trade between Spain and Waterford with, with wine and all that and, and, and various other items. Uh, it was a thriving port and one of the interesting things for me is that they had to employ watchmen that would actually come along, walk up and down, and they'd have a long pole with a hook on it. And the sailors coming back from the pubs in the night time uh, would be drunk and walking up the gangplank. Many of them often fell in and hit your man to be there, the night watchman, with his hook, pulling them out of the river. A lot of times successful, other times not so successful. So you'll see a lot of them buried in places like St. Stephen's graveyard. And uh, later on, when Ballin Nation was built, there's a few sailors out there buried, again, who suffered a similar type of fate that they would have fallen into the river. But that was, uh, that was it. The, regarding the emigration from Waterford, uh, you had large ships like the Orinoco, 
Now, you must remember we had a few shipbuilding. You had the Penroses, you had the Maximuses, you had the Whites. Now, I may have left a few out because I'm not too familiar with uh, uh, the ship builders. However, we, we did have some fabulous uh, ships here that carried, like the Orinoco could carry up to six, 700 passengers from Waterford. During the, probably the 1800s, and even before the famine, there was a huge emigration from Waterford and the surrounding areas. And they would have came in, there was ticket, ticket offices around, like obviously where you're going to get your ticket. And uh, there were, the Waterford ships seemed to be very well provisioned because, as I said, the, the, the people essentially run by the Quakers. Not all the ships now, but those, and you will find them that they were very, you will see a list on the paper as to the type of provisions that they have for uh, the passengers going across. They were very well provisioned, but they cost you. It cost you. But uh, it's great. Then I said, you also had the steamer down there called the Mars. The other ones, the city of Waterford. Great names on ships. The Orinoco, another great name. And uh, so... And there was a story too with the clock tower that it was built for the steamships. Is that right or was that wrong? I don't think so. I think it was just, I don't think it was. I think it was just to beautify the, 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 the t there was great controversy over the, the, the clock tower when it was built because they said it destroyed the whole flow of the quay and they didn't want it built. There was objectors even then, Ollie. And uh, <laughs> so uh, they, they didn't want to build at all, but now it's, it's, it's a I think it's beautiful, but that it destroyed sort of like the whole flow of the quay and that they shouldn't have anything on the quay. Then of course, where we're standing now, you had the market house here on the quay and it is exactly what I said. It later became, and you'd be interested, it later became the Market House Theatre. It became a theatre uh, in, in the 1840s, 1830s, 1840s. And uh, so you would have had all these animals along the quay being exported. You would have had all the barrels. You would have the imports of the, the wood would be lined up that would have been taken from other countries and brought over here, perhaps from Newfoundland, other countries. So it would have been a hive of activity. All people all around, the sailors. It would have been a fabulous, I think it would have been a beautiful sight, you know? And lots and lots of smells again, coming all this stuff from, we say, like Denny Cellar, Queen's Bacon Factory, and all those would be bringing over the bacon and onto the ship, the ship's biscuits from Jacob's here and still a renowned, like the first, I think they or, or some invented the ship's biscuits, Jacobs, who would have been up in Bridge Street, and we all know Figaro's, all those. So Jacobs biscuits originated here in Waterford, and uh, so, and, and again, the bacon was a huge proportion of it. You had Richardson Cellar, you had uh, Denny's. It was really a hive of activity. And just, got, just on the theatre side, on the, Waterford had a lot of famous theatrical people came from, you know, you go back to Charles Keane, people like that. Charles Keane performed here in Waterford, yes, in what was what the Bolton Street Theatre. And there was a woman, was it Jordan? Uh, Dorothea Jordan, yes. she married <coughs> a Pope, uh, uh, Alexander, Alexander Pope, I think she married one of the Popes. And uh, she came from here, yeah. A lot of great actors here. <laughs> so, uh, and just about that, the entertainment, <coughs> what was the entertainment? You would have had all sorts of entertainment. You would have had, I came across a great uh, ad, uh, notice in the paper of some man that died. He was a ticket collector in Cavanaugh's Cheap Theatre. So, and that was up in uh, Bailey's New Street. You know, so there was, that, and that'd be probably in a room in a house. So the, it, it was a great uh, city for theatre and that. And uh, you, of course you had then the famous, uh, the, the, the Waterford, the, what we now know as, you know, the, the Count, the, the, not the Bishop's Palace, say it for me, Ali, I'm at, we'll have to redo that one again. The Theatre Isle? The Theatre Isle, but that was, uh, it originated as a... Uh, oh, the municipal? No, the, not Theatre Isle, but it was a, a merchant's, the assembly rooms, okay. that's where I was looking for. Can we do that bit again? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the assembly rooms, which was built for merchants, local merchants here, and part of that uh, assembly rooms was a small theatre. It later became the Theatre Isle, so the Theatre Isle wasn't purpose-built as such. Uh, it became the Theatre Isle, and an interesting thing about that was when they were doing the present Theatre Isle, as we call it, 1876 one, the old backdrop from the old playhouse was on the wall. Hopefully, it might be still there if they, if they, if they didn't destroy it. And wasn't it true that the Friary was a theatre? The Friary was a theatre too, that was 1829 it became a theatre. Uh, the Olympia Theatre that we danced in Ollie, uh, that, that, was, that, was a, that was a theatre. That was the Beresford Theatre Isle. So yeah, 
Do you know that, no? Tell us, would you have any memory of the Showband era? What, what I was? Go on, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> the band era? Well, I do remember down in, the, down, in the, down, in the, down in the Olympia, and all the women were lined up on one side, and uh, the, the men would be lined up on the other side. And I remember a young fellow, we were going into the glass factory on a Monday morning, and uh, it wasn't a match the weekend, that was the topic of conversation, was how many refusals did you get? <laughs> Because you had to walk that long, lonely walk across the dance floor to ask a girl out to dance. And invariably they said, nope, nope, nope. So you'd have to walk up along the line, depending on how much drink you had. <laughs> and if you're very timid, like I was at that time, you just turn and go back and go back and just... There was no drink in the, theater, in, in, in the Olympia. Uh, so if you, if you got a claim, as it say, if you, if you had a girl, you got a girl and she agreed to dance with you, and after the dance, she said, would you fancy a mineral? <laughs> you see? <laughs> And so it was a mineral bar, and that was it. So we had all lines made up and all for refusals. I remember we sent one fellow over, and he, he was nearly crying. No one had danced with him, you know. And we said, the next one, the next one, George, he doesn't dance with you. Just say to her, uh, say, I'm sorry, I didn't know you had a wooden leg, you see. <laughs> so, so we went over to him, and he said, I'm sorry you have a wooden leg, he said. Would you like to dance? <laughs> so he got a slap in the face. <laughs> And yeah, it's great. And then they brought in the 1960s, then they, they had on Toastal was here, I think it was. And they brought out a drink called Celebration. Oh my God. This stuff was like nitroglycerin. Blow the head off you. Celebration was the name of it. I'm sure now anybody watching this, some of the older guys, let like me say. Baby like Not like baby, like, it was like of a lager, but oh, strong. Popeye wouldn't be able to drink it. It was unbelievably strong. So that. But tell me just about that era because the show band, there was a lot of big names came from Waterloo, wasn't there? Can I just. I was written that. Well, Roisin. Yes, my daughter, I was waiting for her to go into the banquet. They were so Okay, just about the, uh, <coughs> the show bands. I mean, there's a lot of big names came to the Olympia. Do you remember any of them? Uh, oh, uh, Roy Orbison came. I'm not sure about John. I remember, uh, and, and uh, some of the major big acts came, Ali. Names now actually escape me because I wasn't into uh, those bands. I was into the ballads at the time. So we went off really uh, to the smaller pubs for sessions, as they called, you know? What pub? Uh, well, I can't remember the pubs, but I can remember we had the sessions were great. <laughs> At that time, Ollie, I was, uh, I, I was in Sinn Féin, going back to the 60s, and we used to sell the United Irishman. And what we do is we head off, Bernie Coakley, myself, a few other lads, and we go to all, out to Kilmacow, we go down to Passage East, Cheek Point, selling the United Irishman, and uh, we couldn't wait until they were all sold or not sold, so we'd be finished our task selling, then we just sit down, take out the guitars, and it was all about the session. So it's not that I was a political animal, but I loved the sessions, <laughs> you know, at that time. And that's what it was. We went up to Ring, we went all over the place. So uh, there was a great pub across the road here. Uh, I remember Paddy Codes. And it was a great place, and it was the first t place in town that I remember sing songs. And a lot of sailors used to come in off of the ships. And I remember fellas sitting one, and there was a thing called a noble call. So you remember that, yes. So I, I, nom, I, I nominate your man to sing and then, but the fellas were getting up then and they were doing, uh, I, went for a, I went for a walk up a country lane and I heard the dog barking. Woo, 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 and I saw a thrush. <laughs> and this guy was brilliant. He could mimic all the animals that he saw walking up the lane. All the fellas then would be doing other and fellow might recite a poem. But I always remember a sailor in the one day and the first time I ever saw a fella eating glass, got, got up a, and he, and he chewed a glass, and uh, that was it. And some fella then bought him, uh, bet him uh, 10 shillings if he did a large bottle, the, he could, which he couldn't do, you know. There was a trick in that, whatever way they ate the glass. It was only soda glass, it was quite fragile, you know. And, uh, but there was all that in the pubs then, you'd be a big sing-song, you know. And sing-songs would have been big things. But now, there's an interesting thing that I discovered when I was doing the book on the, on the Waterford songs was that I came across very few a local ballads, if you call it. And I think the reason being, and you spoke about the man earlier on, uh, some of the famous uh, uh, musicians here in Waterford, like uh, Wallace, William Vincent Wallace, 
is that people sung an awful lot of opera songs. And I think they were a theatre people. And so they didn't sing the rowdy ballads or the rowdy dumbs or, you know, uh, it, it was all, they seemed to have more refined taste, if you want to put it that way. And they would have sung a lot of the, the, the opera stuff that was going on in the theatres. I suppose it was more of an English town, wasn't it? Than Irish. It, 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 I suppose it was. it was. It was probably a lot more culture here than it would have been in, you know, in, in a lot of other places, in smaller towns, you know. And come here, Jeremy, just about your own story, because, I mean, a glass factory now is history. In yeah. Sense of, like, just going in as a young lad in an apprentice. Can you just talk a little bit about that? I joined in 1964, and I remember I went in, I was like, I say, I was like a Burton's dummy. My mother had me dressed up to the nines. And I remember what I was wearing. I was wearing kind of uh, uh, a khaki pants, a brush nylon shirt, and I said I was quite literally like a Burton's dummy. Totally unsuitable for going into work in a glass factory because, uh, you know, I went, the first I went in, you used to have to wear an apron, sort of like, a, 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 and a, stop all the water and the carpet on them because I was a cutter. And I was the stride, the lovely corduroy pants was the stride. The brush thing was absolutely soaked because you're standing in front of a wheel and the water is spinning towards you. I was soaked to the skin. But uh, I started there in the glass factory in 1964. And uh, a, a great thing that I mentioned, and people forget nowadays, like everybody's kids now want to live someplace. Down to the shop is only down the road. Over here, down to my friend's house is only the other road. I remember lashing rain, I lived in Dyson. It never occurred to me to ask my father for a lift. I just put on a coat and a hat. And I used to meet one of the lads around the corner and we'd walk down to the glass factory, which was in Johnstown at the time. And uh, there's all that, you know, like, uh, it, it's completely, completely changed, you know. I mean, what age were you when you started? I would have been about 16 or 17. Okay, and that was normal at 14? That was normal, like college or anything, that didn't come into the equation whatsoever. I remember my father saying to me, again, as if it was only this morning, right by, he said, time for you to go to work, and brought me down to the mansion house to meet a cousin of ours, Sandy White, and I know that anybody looking at this will remember Sandy very fondly, an absolutely brilliant character, a great character. And uh, Sandy then was worked in the glass, so he got me into, uh, into the factory then. And that was it, that was the start of it there, and I was worked there up to 1982, and uh, enjoyed it, had a, really enjoyed it, thought it was an unbelievable place to work. Glass factory workers were famous for the going off on the exotic holidays. Well, I never went on any holiday. I know fellas did, but they were famous for spending money. Yeah. Because I, there was one fella worked with me on the flat curtain. He had five wage packets. He had so many stoppages. He had one wage packet with the money in it, and another and stoppages printed on that. But another, another, and there were real long wage packets, and another four with all the stoppages. He owed money to the bottle bank. He owed everyone money. But, I mean, an awful lot of traders in town, like, we would have had uh, clothes shops and that. Uh, money would have been stopped out of our wages, payroll deductions, they call them, for everything. And I'd have to say that, without exception, the glass factory was unbelievable for charities. There wasn't a charity that came to the door of the glass factory that the workers didn't support. Whether it was the missions, whether it was the local charity, no matter what it was, have it stopped out of the wages. And quite a lot of our wages actually went on, on charitable donations, you know, and that's something that really irritates me that during the strike people were saying, you know, uh, ah, they, they, they're getting that come up and snow and all that and fellas losing their houses. But people forget there was nobody more charitable than at the Water for Glass workers. Okay, anything else you want to ask? Um, yeah, ask me to remind you, and I forgot to just remember there again, about the pawn shops and the role they... Oh, were. right, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, regarding the pawn shops, uh, what I, I, when I was speaking about Murphy's Lane and Corrigan Lane, a lot of these people lived week to week uh, from stuff that they brought. They might, they might pawn their pants, their shirt, their coat, and only take them out to go to Mass on a Sunday. And, that was, and people actually lived like that. And uh, I came across a great song, I can't remember it now, the, the words of it, but of, of a, a, a fella going, bringing... His, his sister pawned his pants, he couldn't get out. He couldn't leave the house because his sister was after getting his pants and pawned it up in one of the pawn shops in Ballybricken. They probably, I know there was a lot of them in Ballybricken. They were probably all over the town. But people live like that, they didn't have money. They didn't have, you know, like, I know you had a lot of people who would have worked here on the quays, but there was a lot of people. There was probably 30,000 people uh, in the city, the population, you know? And uh, so not everybody worked on the quay, not everybody worked in the cellars. We have, 
people kept pigs and like we might say it's an Irish joke that people have pigs in the kitchen but I came across recently a reference to uh, people up in the Yellow Road who had pigs in the house you know and uh, it came up as a discussion because I remember it mentioned earlier about sometimes a lot of the city councillors own properties and it came up that one fella said it was very unfair that his property was specified as uh, people being, being very bad accommodation and somebody just mentioned, oh yeah, yeah, and sure they're up there and they have pigs living in the house with them. That's up and up, sorry, Ballybricken. That's up, it's up there, the Yellow Road, Lower Yellow Road. You know, I mean, people had pigs in their back gardens. I mean, that was quite, even where I, my grand uncle had pigs in his back garden up in, up in Dial Street. And, uh, and I suppose too, that most of the population lived in the city centre at that time, because there was no John's Park, there was no Cork Road. No, there was places like, uh, the places like uh, Ballytrucker and that. You know, out as far as Kilsey and Lawrence. They again, they would have been Hennessy Road, a small little cottage on Hennessy Road. So that, that would have been the outskirts of the city at the time. And uh, but it was, it was, it was, it was rough going. If you were, if you didn't have any money, it was rough going. You know. And I say the fact that you could no credit unions, no banks, you could go down. If you didn't have money, all you had was what you're wearing. And you brought it down and pawned it, and hopefully that you either begged, borrowed, or stole some money to get your, your, your shirt back or your pants back to go to Mass on a Sunday. Okay. You all right? Yeah, that's great. Any Dermot, other thanks a million. All right, Dermot, just one thing. I mean, you were saying about songs about Waterford. I mean, is there any... What, which one would, would you... Is Waterford by the most famous or...? No, not really. No. It's only the Dublin's made that. But okay. like, like, there was great songs about Usher's Arch, but I never got it all, you know? Uh, there's a great one called The Wedding of Slay Cale. And uh, that's a brilliant song. Uh, and obviously, obviously about a wedding, but it's interesting the way it was pronounced, like Slay Kale, because the problem is modern Hoity uh, Toity uh, word is Schlieve Kale. Totally wrong. It's Schlieve Kale. So, not that a Schlieve is a mountain, Kale means narrow. So, the original uh, Irish word for it would be Schlieve Kale, uh, the narrow way. And it was a narrow lane. And it, like the water the people would pronounce slee, a slay. And so slay kale. And you'd actually see that in papers that so and so from slay kale, S L A Y K E L E. Slay That's kale. Class, isn't it? And, yeah. The narrow way. The narrow way, yeah. And I suppose it's a narrow way out of water. Isn't it? Yeah, it's just a narrow lane. But it kind of lent its name then to an area, you know. <clears throat> Tommy Deegan said to me, you know, is that ring fort that we found is so big? Is that the original is more? It's quite possible, you know, because what's unusual about that, Ollie, is that we have no name on it. Yeah. The name hasn't hasn't, hasn't come down through the through through the, like we have this Moore. Now this Moore was only a ring for two. Liz Duggan was another one. Rat Fadden was another one. They were all over the giant. But why don't we know this name? It's funny. That, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And which, it's so close to the Viking thing. Well, which suggests to me it's quite possible that that was an area that the Vikings attacked and settled up there because of that and it probably was a high status mm. but of course you know um, any 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 uh, and i said to tommy yesterday that the thing about it is woodstown when it was discovered wasn't automatically saved a campaign had to be initiated yeah, yeah, yeah. by a group of academics to save save that it wasn't automatically saved the same as this but the problem is archaeologists are caught between a rock and a hard place oh, sure, it's obvious.